Hey guys, I'm here with Steve from HD Retrovision, and we're going to do a video on how to use a Riggle scope. Is it Riggle? Is it Riggle? I don't know, man. I don't know why you handed me an empty box. <laughs> Hey everybody, this is a video I shot with Steve from HD Retrovision about how to use an oscilloscope to test voltages from your average retro gaming setup. Now this is a completely off the cuff video, there was no script or anything like that. Steve just happened to be in Manhattan, so I figured I would drag him over to my place and shoot this video because this is something I've been wanting to do for a long time now, so I figured I needed to grab the chance while I could. But I'm going to start out by giving just a very quick basic rundown of how to check voltage from a sync line of a cable because that's the easiest voltage of the four to check, RGB sync, because you don't need a white screen. You could just, as long as the console's on and plugged into any kind of display that's running, you can get a full under load voltage reading of it. So here's just a very quick bullet pointed, no explanation uh, cheat, cheat sheet, if you will, of how to check sync. And then we're gonna come back and really go through and explain everything and what each of the settings mean and why we're setting it that way. So I'm just gonna do a quick and dirty, quick way to get a measurement. So uh, let's start out with the easy part with the probe itself. Um, you could either poke it with just a little pin. Uh, I like to leave this on both so you could clip it and to protect it. And here's your ground wire. So just grabbing the cable, hooking the ground clip up to the exposed ground wire, and then we're gonna do sync just because it's on the edge and easy to clip to. So it's set up here, and my probe is randomly just in channel two, so turn on channel two. Um, the settings here, DC coupling, for basic retro gaming stuff, turn on the bandwidth limit, you have to match the probe setting up to what the probe is, and this is a 10 or 1x probe. Uh, 10 is better, so we're gonna set the probe to 10 and set that to 10. Then you can go over here into trigger, um, and you wanna take make sure that these are set properly. So uh, we want edge, source, this is channel two, because it's plugged into channel two. Um, we want the falling, we don't want rising, and we don't want both. Um, and then, at that point, you really just need to zoom into your signal. So you see down here that this is at five volts, and this is in the millivolts, so you really just wanna take this, and you can see as you turn this knob, this changes. So we'll get it to right about 200 millivolts so that we can see it. Um, I like to press these buttons to center it, and then you need to move where your trigger is. Now it just so happened to land right in the middle, but if your trigger was off, you'd see craziness like that. So spin the trigger right into the middle of this falling edge signal. Then at that point, once you're centered, everything's where you need it. To take the actual measurement, hit cursor, and then manual, and you want it top and bottom, not side to side. Once again, source, channel two. Um, would help if I said it to the right source. And then the reading that we want to measure is B minus A. So I'm gonna select B. I'm gonna move that up to the top of the falling edge and you want that right in the middle. Um, then for cursor A, you want that at the bottom of the falling edge. So you get that right in the middle. And if you need help, you can zoom into these things um, and you can recenter. But so just to uh, continue to zoom in a little bit more, that way we kind of lowered it and we'll put a rising and falling so you could see the full thing. Uh, go back and reset the cursor again a little bit right in the middle. right in the middle. So now you have the reading of this signal. So it's 464 millivolts, which is just about the exact that you would want from the sync line of an RGB SCART cable. And now we're gonna go back and explain what all of that is, because that was a very short rundown with no explanation. So for anybody that needs the cheat sheet or anybody that uh, just needs a reminder, that's the best way to test retro gaming signals at least. 
Now that we've shown you what to expect when you're testing voltages, we're going to go back and show exactly why each of the settings are set the way they are. And we're going to be using a Rigel DS1054, which is the same scope that all of us from the Retro Roundtable use. But please keep in mind that we all have all of the software updates added. So if you purchase a bare bones one, it might not look the same. So I'm just going to let Steve do most of the talking, as uh, he's obviously the one that knows what he's doing here. And I'll just try to jump in and tie things together where I can. But sit tight, because this is a really great video that just, if anybody's ever really wondered how or why to use an oscilloscope for retro gaming use, I feel like we did a pretty good job. So here we go. All right, Steve, why don't you unbox this thing and have it show everybody what it looks like. All right. Uh, oh, some sort of worthless papers. <laughs> Um, My old engineer friend said, uh, engineers don't read instructions, they write them. Or ne neither. neither. <laughs> That's good too. Uh, there's some like cables. Maybe uh, somebody actually knows what cables are can help us with that. It's the um, probes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more, more probes. And uh, I don't know, there's just like this other thing in here. Oh, delicious. Do not eat them. What? Those you, can, you, can, you can read Japanese? <laughs> oh god. Um, you just toss the box on the floor. For the instrument scene, right? Alright. Hey, this has been opened before. Yes, I opened it to, uh, to load up all of the firmware that I totally paid for. Alright. So I'll flip up these uh, legs. Feels like you're going to break them, but... So we're going to start out just by hooking everything up. And Steve, you have a very interesting method of hooking something up here. You have, uh, you have the SCART input right here. And then, could you explain once again what the, the these little T adapters are for? So, so our goal here is to send the SCART all the way to the monitor, but we want to tap it midway. Okay. And so we have these like splitters basically, like this T adapter where uh, um, the signal will be read by the scope, but it's still just gonna, current's still gonna flow through into here. We only have the sink hooked up right now to the monitor, but I was gonna hook up, I can hook up the other three that it gets a little crowded in here. Um, we could actually, if we're gonna do sync first, we could, uh, Give ourselves we'll just leave one in just, yeah, we'll just do one. To... So uh, we're not terminating here. The monitor is terminating well, on this end because you want the cable from cable source to cable end. You want this to terminate. So in your average setup like this, you actually don't recommend using the pass through of a PVM monitor. Uh, no, I've. I think it would cause it would be a little more complicated because then. You, then you would need term. I mean, you can, you can run it in through the input and then the output comes here, but then you need to terminate with the terminators on here. So you could do that. I typically like to terminate at the monitor though. So if I'm looking at stuff and want to view it on the monitor, this is how I typically do it. Okay. All right, so for now you want to just grab the SCART cable that's hanging on the other side of the monitor. Yeah. So we are just going to plug that into the female input. Okay. So we get sync. We still want it. We want that to show up, right? Uh. We could do that. It's not a problem. Yeah. So right now you've just connected. Um, you've just connected the wires that are going on the output side. Or no, you just connected the other, uh, the output of the start adapter to these just to send it over to just the Just to send it over. I mean, I could start plugging stuff in here, just but so it's going to get a little crowded and I want to show the controls easier. Gotcha. Um, okay, so let's fire up the scope and uh, kind of just show what to do. Well, first you got to wait. Yeah, it takes a while to boot. Yeah. That's how you know it's good. <laughs> It can properly count through its uh, countdown loop. Gotta love the sound of relays clicking, right? <laughs> That's how you know things work, right? 
Okay. So now we're up and so the, what what is the beginner step to learning this? What do we even how do we even begin when we start out something like this? Uh, first you got to set up the channel uh, that you want to read. Okay. So right now it, auto it automatically either somebody had channel 1 selected before the last time you turned the scope on or but typically it would, let's say they're all off. So it's channel one, two, three, four, and it's not reading any of them because you have them disabled. The green light means, hey, I want to read channel two, and it'll show up channel two. Nothing's connected. It's zero. Gotcha. Yeah. So once you've selected the channel and that you could see something on the screen, what's the next step? Well, well, it, you select the channel, um, and you got to set up a few things first before you're really, like, can start adjusting the size and everything like that. Um, so... The most important ones are here at the top. It's the coupling. Is, uh, so DC coupled um, means that it's not AC coupled. It's not getting rid of the DC value. It's not dumping this input through a big series capacitor uh, before going into the scope. So a lot of times the AC coupling is, I think, the most useful for like noise measurements on uh, like power supplies. So if you hook up like a five volt DC power supply and you want to see the like the ripple current, the noise on it, you put it in the AC and then you're, it'll get rid of the five volt is all the noise is riding on. And then you can look and really expand out the noise and it's very useful. But typically we're going to be using DC unless you, it's easier for you to shift your level down. Cause if you have something like at three volts, and you want to look at something tiny, you're going to be adjusting the scale and the position like crazy trying to get it. So we can get into that later. But basically right now we're just going to do DC uh, because most likely this is already AC coupled. There's a series capacitor on the sync line probably. That's why I'm getting a negative. You mean on the, on the sync line of the cable? Right. Our input on the sync already has a... Um, from the console, there's a series capacitor. It's because, like, this one okay. here, this is channel one, that's zero, that's ground, this arrow. Okay. It's showing you where ground is, and so we're going negative, which tells me that it, we're already AC coupled. Okay. Sorry, this is a long-winded conversation, or a long-winded answer, but. Well, it's very easy when you talk about these things. The correct explanations and the correct answers to a lot of these questions are long and yeah. detailed. So um, keep doing what you're doing, but I'll try to, to keep it uh, simple once we once we get yeah. into it as well because we're like I'm winging this uh, we, didn't, we didn't prepare any of this so uh, and uh, so the next one is the bandwidth bandwidth limit um, and then it could set a 20 megahertz low pass filter if you're looking at really noisy things um, it's good to have that on typically it's good to have it on if you know anything you're looking at is below that it's just good to have that so you're not there's plots are cleaner and stuff like that. So for the average scenario of somebody testing RGB cables in retro gaming, do you suggest that the uh, there's a, a filter put on that setting or just leave it off? I typically have it on, but I mean, there's situations where you want to see everything, no matter, you don't know if you're looking at noise, you don't know what you're looking at. But so you leave make it sure on, but always double check off, especially if, if you're working if, on any projects. Yeah, like have that in the back of your head. That and what setting do you usually live it at? It's it's, there's only two. Okay. There's off and 20 megahertz. Okay. That's it. Um, so the next one is the probe setting, uh, the, the probe attenuation. So these probes that come with, they're typically used um, in the 10x mode. There's a switch on the side. Uh, there's a, this side is 10x and this side is 1x. You get better performance when it's at the 10x, but then you gotta tell the scope, hey, I have a 10x probe connected. Gotcha. Um, so when you're using these probes, uh, you would wanna have it in 10x, and uh, people, don't, some people don't know that this is a clip thing that uh, has a little nice like, spring-loaded thing you could attach me, uh, leads to. Yeah. So that's spring-loaded so that you could attach leads to it, but yeah. if you wanted to, uh, so that, try to get that in focus there. So you could have leads right in there, but if you didn't want to, you could just pop it off yep. and just use the actual tip itself. Yep. Okay. I, I like to put it back on because uh, if this falls, the 
pro tip falls on the floor or somebody steps on it, it it's just a nice protection to have as right. well. Always cheaper so, to replace the caps than the whole probes. Exactly. Um, so because we're not doing any probe attenuation on here, we want to change this to one X. So you press this probe button and then you got your little like um, dial here to- Gotcha, yeah, so you, this is one. the dial that's going to change that. Yeah. So you go to one and then click it in, press it in. There you go. And th those are the the main ones you really need to know. So on really the just the top three, DC, off, yeah. you could have it on, try it with both in your settings and then probe uh, 1X for the basic stuff like this, but also make sure that your probe is set to 1X. If you, yeah, if you're gonna use 1X uh, with this probe, put it on 1X here, but otherwise, I, I, I usually run these at 10 because you get better performance. So what should people who buy this DS 1054 scope run that. If you if they're running the probe, set the probe to 10x, and then set that to 1x. Set it to 10x. But if you if you're going to do this, what we're doing right now, which is not a probe, oh. you set it to 1x because there is no switch in here, right? Setting it. There's, okay. There's no attenuation switch. See, you're forgetting, Steve, that you need to talk in Bob language so I can understand it. Um, <laughs> all right, if you're using a probe, which we will not be, yes. if you're using the probe, then make sure to match the probe settings to this, and yes. 10x, you're gonna get better results. But this, your fun little uh, T adapter idea, yeah. uh, this just makes it easier for people in the gaming world because you can still see what's on screen, um, and you can have access to all this at once, so just use the 1x from that. Yeah. So basically, if you're it's just a, somebody it, testing an arcade board, testing your own cables, um, really for home use, this is perfect. But if you're somebody designing their own boards, uh, designing the next super gun, you're going to want to use these directly to it. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. It, this is just telling like what what is on this input, and it's like okay, just whatever is on it show on the screen. This one is uh, doing an attenuation, and so this undoes the attenuation. And the numbers that show up because this is, is reducing it by 10 this will multiply it by 10 and show you the right numbers it's a little trick that they use to get better performance out of these pro no it makes sense now yeah so, okay okay so that's the channel menu and then the the next important one i'd like to show is the trigger menu and so typically we're just going to use edge triggering um there is a video and mode that I kind of don't quick. Though. Yeah. Um, how do you get back between that menu and this menu? So, uh, so this was the trigger menu. Hit menu. If you want to get back to the channel menu, you hit just the channel. channel again. And it won't turn it off. The only time it'll turn it off is if you hit it twice. Okay. Um, so but that doesn't reset the setting. No, when no. You turn it off. No, so. it just stops it from displaying on the screen. Okay. So once it's, you're out of this, you just hit this menu to go into yeah. trigger and it yep. says trigger right there. I'm not sure if the focus is catching it, but it actually says trigger. Uh, yep. And there, there's only a few settings here, but they're super important. Uh, we're typically going to do edge triggering. Even if you go in the menu, there is a video trigger. Now the problem is the video trigger is expecting interlaced. So if you're gonna run to 240p uh, into it, it's gonna be wonky. It's not gonna do exactly what you want. But you would use video for 480i, or you can, you, you can. You can. Uh, I mean, you can get away with just using edge. Uh, it's just gonna. You see how it's kind of like wonky. Yes. Um, it's because it doesn't know exactly where to trigger because it's not periodic. It's not always the same because composite sync has this little goofy area that changes. Um, and if it's in a set to, if it's an interlace pattern, since interlace is pretty standardized, they program these guys to expect that pattern for interlaced, but not for progressive. It's Understandable. Goofy. Yeah, it's it's goofy. But I, I think we should just focus on edge because it gets us most of what we need. Absolutely. So uh, it's easier. Yeah, it's just that's the basic triggering so method for scope. Here's, here's just going back to, to my basic understanding of things. Even though you hit this menu, you still use this dial to change settings? Uh, this is the universal like selection wheel. Okay. Like. <laughs> so th this is only used for other So then this is the level. So there is a... Uh, so you, you want to set your trigger level. So, you, so on a sync pattern, oh, you want to set it where there's an edge, right? And this is your edge polarity. That's what the slope is. Um, and typically the 
for standard depth video, it's falling edge. And all that's gonna do is your trigger point. So you set your level where you want it to trigger. And because I'm kind of aiming at this falling edge, it's detecting that there is a falling edge and it's centering it around this T here. Um, so that's the where the scope is kind of like starting in time-wise. Okay. Um, so it sees that edge and then it's like starts saving data, basically. Uh, so the, the, we also have the trigger source set to channel one because we have so nothing else. So the type is in. edge. The source is obviously channel one because that's what we're looking. Yeah, the slope, the falling edge is literally just, it looks like an edge drop, yep. dropping down with an arrow pointing down. Yep. Okay. Um, and then the, the sweep, uh, I would probably just need to do auto. Um, there, the other ones are a little more complicated and I, I don't think we really need to get in into that. Uh, auto just means it's going to try to trigger um, every time. Mm -hmm. uh, normal, uh, which you can either get to by going to the menu or you can hit mode here and it'll switch from auto normal. Uh, normal, you, if let's say I set my trigger point way up here, nothing's going to happen because it's not seeing anything and because it's not on auto, it's not going to update at all. But if I set it to auto, it can't lock on, but it's still trying to. Okay. And then just by moving your trigger uh, back down yeah. within the falling edge. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, look at that. I'm scoping. Scoping it out. <laughs> Step two, man. So, um, so you notice like we're kind of like aiming like in a little small spot. So let's, let's kind of like make this bigger so you can see it better on the scope. To zoom in, correct? Yeah. So, so we have our so chan- once you're done with the channel settings and now we're done with the trigger settings cause we just need those top four set, right? Yeah. Unless you, let's say you got something really small and you're trying to do triggering, um, but you're not getting anything. Maybe let's make it bigger and then we'll go back to triggering. Just, you okay. know, kind of like go back and forth. So let's it's only going to have to do a lot with the scope. Right. You don't do step one, that's done forever. Step two, that's done forever. So, like you're going back between these settings a lot. Gotcha. It's, it's, there's no straightforward way for this stuff. So it's something you got to practice a lot. It requires a lot of practice and experience. So your channel menu here, um, it, it says vertical here. So this says vertical, and this is your your amplitude of your signal, basically. And you could shrink it and make it bigger by adjusting this uh, this scale knob. And then you, there's a position knob here that can position it. Here, I don't know if I, I don't no, want to block perfect. the screen. Yeah. Positions it up and down. And if if you notice, this ground point is just shifting up. And if you want to get it back to middle, you click it, and it'll go back. That's so handy. Yeah. So essentially, this isn't changing the settings. It's just changing the the mode that you're viewing. Yeah, let's just make it easier to zoom in onto the. Just fitting it onto the screen differently. In different voltages and different pulses would be in different places. Yeah. So you would have to zoom out and recenter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then there's also this one says horizontal, and so you could do the same horizontally. So I can scale it horizontally. And I can move. Well, that's actually pretty cool. Can you uh, zoom out yeah. for a moment just to demonstrate what that looks like? Yep. So now you're actually seeing the rising and falling of the signal, which is actually the perfect demonstration on why you would need an oscilloscope and not a multimeter. Because if this was one straight voltage signal, it would be a straight line across. Uh, so if we were measuring like a 9 volt battery, it would just be one right over, whereas this is the, the actual sync pulse up and down. Very yep. cool. Yeah, you could you could also do the same centering trick with this, so it brings the trigger point back to. Love it. So centered, centered, um, and then we still want the trigger to be right about in the middle of I, the I, falling yeah, edge. Yeah, middle middle of the edge is what the best place is because if you notice when you were going to the tops and bottoms is kind of like mm -hmm. there's noise and more noise in those areas and so what we're looking at here is noise correct so what we're looking at here is if you when you zoomed out and you notice this kind of like blip every once in a while mm -hmm. that's the uh, v-sync pattern that happens every once in a while this is what compile why composite sync is weird 
Okay. Um, it's because they're mixing H and V together in a weird way, and that's the V part. Huh. <laughs> I've never visualized that before. Yeah, uh, but it's like it's going all over the place because it doesn't know where it is, and it's uh, but. Um, I mean, we, yeah, we could definitely, we should definitely go over that uh, once we kind of cover the basics, which I think we did, didn't we? Yeah, I think we're all set. So that right now, now where does it list the actual numbers that it's showing? Okay, so there's a couple ways to do it. Um, I've, I'm going to call it the wrong way and the right way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just so people can point out or identify when people might do it another way and they know like maybe their their measurements aren't adding up is because it could be because of this um so typically what a lot of people do is they um <clears throat> they do a measurement they the scope has a built-in measuring capability for a bunch of different things right now i got like some time stuff showing up on the menu so i can measure the period frequency rise time fall time pulse width um stuff like that um, so there is, hold on, where is the vertical measurements? There we are. So there's vertical measurements. So what people typically do with sync is like, oh, it's a pulse. I'm going to measure it. Um, the, either the peak to peak or the V amp. So peak to peak gets all like your little noise peaks. V amp kind of cuts out. If you zoom in, you can see in the picture that that's what they're trying to tell you. Okay. Um, and every time I've described uh, a falling signal like this, I've described it as peak to peak. So VPP. Yeah. Is that correct, or have I been doing it wrong? All no, no, you described it right. It's just there's going to be like little like blips. Okay. Like even like super fast glitches. The peak to peak is going to catch those. And typically, you don't care about them. So you probably want to do V amp. Okay, so let's hit up VM. Which, so it says 467 millivolts. So it's trying to do its measurement automatically. So beforehand. I'm not sure if we can zoom in here. I'll try to in post, but that says 467 MV. Yes. So that actually falls directly in the correct voltage recommended for sync, right? Right. All right, Rob. Ha. <laughs> we were using your cables. <laughs> I was going to be pretty upset if your cable wasn't right, but well done, sir. Yeah. Well, well done. like I said, this is the, the typical way some people measure, but this is not how I measure at all. So how do you measure? So I use the cursors. So if you press this button here called cursor, um, right now it's off. So we could either press it again to turn it on, or you can just go into this menu and turn on uh, whichever one you want. I just think we should go over the manual cursors. So let's go to, ma dang it. <laughs> manual. Okay. So you have the source you want to measure your cursors on, because let's say you have like four things up, but uh, you want to select which channel you actually want to measure. We only have channel one, so boom, easy. Uh, so now we can select like either vertical cursors or horizontal cursors. So verticals are going to measure time, right? Right. And the horizontal ones are going to measure the amplitude. So we want the horizontal cursors. Yeah, so just, uh, I think I assumed everybody knew what we were looking at, but from a stripped down basic point of view, what we're essentially looking at is time being slowed down. So we're looking at the signal entering in and yes. then it's dropping out. So, so it's essentially a time machine because we're... Uh, <laughs> so, so basically what's, what's happening is your CRT is drawing a line and then it's getting, on this falling edge, it's getting a signal, hey, dude, go back to the left and then it's going to do it again. Hey, back, go back to the left and do it again. That's what this signal is representing. Okay. So you have the, um, uh, you have the amplitude... For vertical yes and then this is the time so right now you've the, selected in this I, grid i selected the the uh, horizontal bars okay. um so if i like move this thing now i'm moving this line and i want what i'm going to do is kind of like position it over this top of the signal and the bottom of the signal is going to give me the difference so do you try to hit that line in the center of that bar or right on top of it I hit it in the center. Other people um, okay. don't, and I, for me, it doesn't make too much sense. Uh, why is this not? Hold on. 
Oh, it actually set it to fine. Okay. It's like, why is it not scrolling up? Okay. So, I mean, you want to try to get it in, in as much as the screen as possible. So you see how it's kind of noisy? Um, so let's zoom in a little bit. It's kind of like noisy. It's because I didn't have that bandwidth limit on. And now it's like a lot cleaner okay. to look at. Okay, so what I'm going to do is kind of get it, go back to my cursor and move the top of the cursor. So once again, you literally just hit the cursor button. Cur cursor button and then the universal knob of uh, doing stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so cursor A is there is the non-dotted line. It's a solid line. And then cursor B is a dotted one. But I, if I click in now, it, it it's hard to see, but cursor A used to be highlighted in blue and light blue and now this one's highlighted in blue. And now so that allows now you to move the bottom, bottom one. one. Yeah. Oh, I was wondering how you were getting there. Okay. So I sent the position them in the center and then uh, and over here where it says uh, BY minus AY that's that's the measurement that I would take. So Which is very close here. to what that one is doing. So that says 464. So that is incredibly close. So yeah, basically, it, it, for it, it depends on the signal you get. Like this is a really basic signal. Right. Um, I've seen, like when you're doing like actual video stuff, you're gonna get really wonky measurements if you rely on the auto measure. So I suggest doing everything with cursors. So if you're just somebody at home wanting to make sure their super gun isn't gonna blow out their open source scan converter. Just using the, the original basic mode that we just showed was probably good enough in almost Probably case. for sync, yes. But not for the RGB lines. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't okay. rely on it for anything other than that. Okay, so let's um, let's uh, reconfigure. Let's hook up the RGB lines to this, and then let's oh. walk this through it again. All right, so what you have here is yep. the output of the SCART adapter yep. going into these BNC connectors, um, into the scope, and then out through BNC cables into the RGB monitor yep. over here. It would probably so, it would probably be more elegant if we had an, yet another right angle, so we could come in and back out at right angle, but I only brought four. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Um, as you showed before, uh, we'll be able to get to everything we need to here. Okay. Um, these can't touch each other, right? Uh, they can, uh, because I think there's a... Well, it depends on what you're hooking up. Okay. I mean, I wouldn't. I would try to avoid it, but... Yeah, we'll just space those suckers out then a little yeah. bit. But all right, so let's... Um... It's not bad, it's just like your signal integrity might... Right. Yeah, nothing, nothing will like, blow up. <laughs> So right now we're loading up the HD Retrovision test software um, for the purpose of getting solid color and color bars. Um, the 240p test suite I believe has some too, but for this I would actually recommend the Retrovision software just because it's one button pushes to select between modes. I still love the 240p test suite, I just use it for different things than this. So, uh, Right, this is better suited for like scope stuff, because especially like if you're going to do it blind, right? Uh, because it auto jumps into a pattern gotcha so yeah. you know that once it's loaded yeah you turn the computer or you turn the console on you count to 20 and you know just That's to be safe five four seconds i would be uh you know me i'm always <laughs> overly cautious and then you know it's going to end up at this yeah. so that if you press the button you know what's coming yeah. next once you get proficient enough you'll know when it shows up on the Ah, <laughs> you'll be able to even see and understand what the patterns yeah. are. So at the moment, we're still on channel one, which we have as sync at the moment. So it looks right. exactly as it did before. So uh, why don't you go through and just quickly set up the other channels as kind of a, a refresher course on what we just learned. So there, were, I guess there was one more thing about sync though that I oh, think okay. we like. It was remember like how this is kind of like going wonky mm -hmm. is because of that vertical sync. Well, first let me get. I'm gonna get rid of the cursors because this box kind of like. Right. It, so you just press cursor a couple times until it says off. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we started to see that when we kind of like zoomed out, right? So every once in a while we get this like blip. And the best way to do this is to press this single button. 
So it's one all the way up here. Yeah, and so, right. and you would keep pressing it until you got in that area. And the better, like, it could get, this gets complicated, but uh, I don't know how much you want to go into this. Because there's a way to make, instead of just, like, guessing for 10 seconds until you get it, you can... You, you can increase the amount of data you're acquiring and then but then it gets like I think for this one I'd like to keep it simple because okay. not only am I making a video for other people to watch I yeah. myself I'm going to be using this to remember how so, to use this code <laughs> so I, I would try to, to zoom out a little bit uh, so you increase your chances of you help oh, we got lucky <laughs> so you basically keep hitting single until now you see a solid line yeah, on the bottom yeah well it could be it could have showed up here it could have showed up here so but then once it does you could center it over where it did show up and then you could zoom back in and take a look um but this is the, the v-sync portion oh that's interesting the, yeah so uh, so this is the uh, last uh, line of video, and then you get your V-Sync, and then it tells the CRT to go back up. Very, uh, I've never actually seen that um, singled out like this before. Yeah. I mean, I've seen the pictures, but I didn't grasp what I was looking at. So, um, if I hit clear, it's just gonna go back to the way it was? Clear, I think clear is the screen. Oh, let's not do that. So how do, how do we set it back to the other view? Oh, where it's just auto, do it, it just hit run. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I saw it and went from red to green. So here's what we were looking so yeah, at you, before. You could, well, all single does, it just hits run stop like one after another. It just runs and stops, runs and stops. Oh. That's how I have to do it on the, the older so scope. So you're not looking at that in real time. No. Single is just taking a snapshot. Single snapshot, yeah. Because you can't look at it in real time because if it updates the next time it gets to the edge, it's not going to be the edge you want. That, that's what makes this complicated is they're both falling edges, but they're different, right? Okay. All right, so I kind of see it down there, but I'm just going to keep taking it. There we go. Yeah. So now I could um, zoom in. Yeah. The, that's the position. That's the positioner? Yeah. Yep. And since it's in single mode, this is the single snapshot of yep. the signal before. This is that not was a real single, time. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I should so have So now we can that. do that. Okay. Yeah. That, that's really nice, ha handy, having this single, because the old scope, I had to hit run, stop, run, stop, run, <laughs> stop. Um, well, that's it, actually really neat. So that if you're just testing for voltage, just for safety reasons, um, just the basics, fine. But for if you actually are analyzing a signal, so you want to actually read where the vertical sync comes in, did, you could single it out and get your snapshot here. There's a lot of consoles that have goofy stuff in this area. They're not doing stuff like in, up to spec in this area. <laughs> yeah, but wasn't the original Master System one of the ones that had issues with this? Yeah, the, the map, well, the first VDP revision of the master system doesn't have these uh they call them serrated pulses this thing just hangs low for this whole time and huh. so it loses if it's something that the point of these is to keep horizontal sync during your vertical sync oh okay. so if they're not there and something relies on that and that's why you get the screen that curves up into the right on some because it layers. loses sync for a bit until it comes back here and reacquires it interesting yeah okay all right, so let's set up each uh, each one for RGB then. Okay. All right, so let's set up each one for RGB so we can have a full RGBS signal on the scope. Okay, so we only had channel one activated, so let's activate the other channels. And we wanna we wanna run again, correct? Uh, we can uh, either before or after I set up let's the channels. Do it so we see stuff okay. in real time. Okay. Hey, look at that! Now cool. we get a signal. So we enable channel two, but I also want to bandwidth limit it. And then I also want to set the probe to, to, to 1x because so we're, we're not really using it. So a these probe. were the first steps that we originally yeah. talked about. Um, DC coupling, you want to set it to 20. And then probe 1, because we're not using the probe, we're using direct BNC into it. Yep. And then we do the same thing for 3. So uh, put the bandwidth limit, uh, put this to 1. Channel 4. Same thing. So now we want to try to like fit everything all on the same screen. So let's uh, let's go from top to bottom, one through f one to four. So let's go back to hit channel one 
and channel one will show up and now we can move it and scale it and stuff like that so let's let's first shrink it this is the yellow one right let's put it like up top here and we still we're still going to trigger off the sink it's a, still the best of these four inputs to trigger off of okay um that's where we want our starting unit point the trigger point to be so let's go to channel two now let's shrink this guy um let's put them over here it's channel three let's see if we can fit everything on the screen So that's everything, and now we could like, let's zoom into one line, the video. So let's just take a single snapshot so we can look at it. Okay. So this is what the color bar pattern looks like. All right, so we and still have color bar pattern over here on the RGB monitor, and this is what it actually looks like on the scope. So, so can you explain how you would read this on the scope then? How Can you get voltages from this or? You can get voltages. I, but first I kind of wanted to explain like how this relates to that. Okay. Because this is the best, I think the best pattern to do that with. So not a, a solid white screen, but actually the test pattern, the, uh, the right. color Right, so, so if you notice we have, we have sync and then I have my red hooked up into channel two, my green hooked up into channel three and the blue hooked up into channel four. Okay. And so what this pattern is showing is my red is going to the maximum for a bit, going down for a little bit and then up and then back down. And then this green is kind of just transitioning once, but the blue is transitioning four times. So what's happening here is white is all three colors at the same time. Okay. So this is where all three of them are max on the scope. Okay. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. And then blue goes away, but red and green stay. That's your yellow. Okay. And then blue comes back, red goes away, and then uh, so you have green and blue, and that's your cyan. And then this is it as it's going across the screen. That's interesting. I'm starting yeah. to grasp what that is now. So if you look at just the green, so just the green, right? That would be the spot right here on the scope where there's just green and there's no red and there's no blue. Huh. And same thing with red and blue. Those are the easiest ones to look at, right? Your white has everything. Your red should just have red. So it's right here. Red, no or red, no red, no red. Uh, blue should is this peak here because that's blue but there's no green and no red and then all the way at the end is black because there's nothing well that's pretty interesting so that, that that's why i like this pattern is maximum amplitudes for everything mm -hmm. but you see the positioning of the colors and you know like if you put a white screen which we can do we'll do that like right now so we could go to a white screen and we hit single, single. They all look the same because when white, they're all the same. Okay. All right, so can you show us just a little bit more about like a good use case for this and different things to look at with the different patterns now that we have everything aligned on the screen? Uh, yeah, so right now I have the, the color bar. This is the 100% color bar pattern. And uh, here, let me go run this and there's other p patterns on this software and that and I just kind of want to show like how these things change so this is the full amplitude color bar patterns where it swings from max red green and blue to zero like when it's doing these bars and then that one's 75 ish percent because there's a limitation in the genesis see the source code if you're curious but uh these if you notice it everything shrunk down a bit yeah yeah, so that's because the amplitude went down for all the channels. Oh, so we're actually watching in real time. Yes. You just demonstrated why there's, you know, um, multiple on some and not on others. Yeah. And now we're actually watching the voltage rise and fall based shrink, on... Shrink down. Um, and then uh, if I go to gray, gray, gray is RGB values. So any grayscale is 
the same for red is the same for blue is the same for green that's why it shows up to identical on there and i just did a single so it, it's not wonky but this is a ramp down of values. so that's interesting so the sync signal will obviously stay the same because yes. it's just the synchronization mm -hmm. of the everything being drawn but this looks identical now for all of them because all it's just the line. Any, anything that's from a grayscale from from black to white is going to show up the same on all and channels. And are we? Is this a literal interpretation of this is all the way? Uh, this is the highest one, so you yes. have white. So and then as the brightness steps down, you're actually watching the yes. brightness step down. So each one of these bars is this line on each. Yep. That's pretty incredible. Seems like you got maybe a little contrast problem because you can barely see on your thing this one from this one yes but, that's because jose hasn't recapped the monitor yeah, yet yeah uh, we'll redo but, this again but that, that's a cool thing to observe that. actually and now with this uh, i didn't even realize this until i just said that out loud but bef we'll do a before and after of this monitor after uh, with the capacitor replacement so you could actually see it in the oscilloscope and you could see on screen the values that might be different because it's going to be more accurately displayed Huh. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then I guess there's a few more of these. Uh, so all white is how the best way to test just voltage. If you just were looking to. If if you if you, if you want to do just voltage and you don't care what channel you're measuring. Okay. Then yeah, I would say. Do just white. easiest for white screen. Yeah. I, for I, anybody I, watching, um, the I have auto white balance set just to compensate for all the different colors. So if that screen doesn't look white, it's just because I'm trying to make this look more bearable. <laughs> it, what I actually programmed the white screen for mm -hmm. in this uh, was so I can find how long an active line of video is from the Genesis. So when I capture stuff, I can get screenshots at the right aspect ratio. So that's why I use white. Huh. But you can use whatever you want for whatever reason you want, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, like if I was going to do that, I could do a cursor measurement. Uh, and I would do the vertical bars. And I would measure from when it goes white to black. Let's do black or well, from black to white to white to black, and it tells me it's roughly 47.8 microseconds. And then I have all these goofy calculations that I do based on that to kind of scale it. And So that's, that's one use so case. To check the voltages, um, now I think it's pretty impractical, in, impractical, impractical for somebody who, um, who wants to just check their cables to have all of these up at once. But if just in case you're in the middle of doing another experiment that requires everything hooked up and you still want to check um how do you how would you set this right now so that we could just check the voltage so we want to know what's coming out of the white screen on let's say red yeah okay so what i would do is i would put the cursors up again okay i would select channel two because that's the red uh well we have red hooked up and i would select the horizontal bars and then I would get, this is channel two, right here. And I would use what we talked about, about cursors. Um, so that's about right. So you get 680 millivolts. If, if you want to be like super anal accurate about it, I, I mean, you could scale it up. Well, so I think better. once once you're using a scope, um, you've already crossed the line of making sure that you're doing pretty precise measurements. So if you're a little bit loose with exactly where your line is positioned yeah. on this, if you're really just worried about voltage, so, so, you'll be able to know. You're not going to be a yeah. You know, if this if this cursor line is just a hair off, you're not going to have a reading that's going to destroy no. your equipment. You're going to still know that that reading's way off. Right. 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 This is, I'm just saying like more for, like what I did for like the SNES and Genesis cables where I measured every revision and stuff. I was like super anal, because those, those measurements were processed, put in a spreadsheet, averaged over all this different nonsense and then actually used to make a circuit, right? Right. Uh, but for something like this, no, you don't need to go and zoom in if you, um, for something like that, yeah. So, um, 
Did we cover everything that you would think a good first step beginner scope video for the analog video retro gaming world would cover? Other than, of course, going in with the probe, which I'll do before we're, we're finished. Um, for beginners, let me see if there's something else. Uh, let me run it. Let's see if there's another pattern or anything. Being able to single out the, the shots, being able to use the cursors to actually go in and go on the top and bottom of the line in order to get the correct reading. Um, th those are the steps that, you know, how to set up each mode so that you're reading correctly. I think those are the steps how, that are going to be. How about most. taking a screenshot? Yeah. Okay. I think that's a. So there's important. with this model scope, I believe uh, I could be wrong, but there's a few ways that you could actually do that. You could use the USB port here to save mm -hmm. them, and I believe there's also a network port on the back. So if you run the app, can't you actually just do screen caps? I, I think you could do it through the network, and then they get also give you a USB cable. So I think oh, you, you right. can you can there's a driver that you install um, for the USB to talk to this as well. Very cool. But I haven't so, used that yet. <laughs> okay, so how do you do screenshots then? Uh, first, we need a USB stick. Uh, I'll show it through the U just through the USB port because that's what the fastest way to do it is. All right, so we have the USB stick in here just to show the easiest. Get rid of the cursors. Yeah. So you just hit the cursor until you get, uh, to get rid of them just to clean it up. And how do you do the actual screenshot? So I would first do a single shot or stop the scope. So whichever one you want to do, so you, it's like, this is exactly what I want to save. You don't want to start saving while it's still running and right. you might get a glitch or something. Okay. So hit single, get, be like, okay, this is what I want to save. This is great. I love this shot. But now I got to put it on the stick. Okay. <laughs> so you would hit storage and uh, up here, so we're going to, we'll do a so picture. Picture, for, PNG. All right. Yeah. So picture. Uh, there's other ones, but right now we'll just do a picture and we'll maybe okay. go of, over some of some other ones. And I think PNG is the best for graphics. Yeah, me too. Um, Bitmap's a little overkill for scope captures, so. Yeah, yeah, PNG, JPEG is ugh, for graphics. It right. just blurs everything. So just, PNG is the default. Uh, param, I'm thinking it, it saves like some parameters along with the picture. I typically don't use it, so I just leave it off. Um, Let's leave it on just to see what it does. Okay. Um, so you hit save, and then it's gonna. Oh, well, this didn't detect. Does this have to be formatted something in particular? Because that's it Fat might 32. Be. It should be Fat 32, should be correct. Hold on. It didn't show up. This is like the internal memory. It should say. So if it says local disk, that's the internal memory. Yeah. That's not what you want. There should be another thing in the list. So we plugged it in and it says flash drive, flash drive file system in a failure. <laughs> ah, well, all right, let me get another flash drive. Okay. All right, so we have the Super Media Brothers USB stick from Retro USB through an extension <laughs> cord, and that seems to work. Okay. So I'm just going to go in again and hit save. Is that it? Then I go down using the disk D universal yeah. thing right here. Yeah. And, and press there. inside. And so. Uh, now, you, I mean, you could start a new folder, but I think doing yeah. any file management on this stuff is it's a nightmare. crazy, so you would so, just hit new file. New file, and again, it's going to ask you to name this. Just, just hit, it hit, says okay. new file one, it's going to do new file two, new file three. Uh, just take it out, put it in a computer, and rename it. So that text file is the data. Like, that normally doesn't save, but you hit param on. Very cool. Uh, I don't know what's in there, but... <laughs> and then you just go back. Yeah. And now you're just back to the regular scope, and you could start running again. Yep. Uh, so another thing that me and Nick use a lot is the uh, is the CSV save. And so what that does is... So it says data source. So this uh, says screen right now, which means there's a certain amount of data points it uses to draw the screen, and it's kind of limited uh so you can save all those points into a csv file and you can look at it or do stuff like in excel or whatever um but we use memory which means that this saves 60k points 60,000 points you can get from this and put it in excel and do really fine detail stuff but you can even increase this number because this number was auto 
selected this is mem depth i went to acquire and there's a mem depth setting so it's set to auto by default but if you're like i want like a million points <laughs> which you can do let's do three million points wow um that's it's actually the three million is would be it would save that many points that's crazy uh, there's a little it's hard to read this i kind of don't want to get into it because we're kind of staying basic but that's how much data it's saving versus how much it's showing on the screen but but we use that um here i'll put it back on auto because that's it runs better on auto like responsiveness i should say but that memory csv save we use just once again hit storage and hit you have it set to csv hit yeah. save same thing, uh, just new file. New file, and I'll do it. And just hit OK, because we don't care what it's yeah. called. CSV. Um, this is going to be a lot longer than just the picture, because it's a lot of data. It's going to be like uh, megabytes instead oh. of like kilobytes. So when you save the long data, you should really give it a few minutes to save? It's going to be a while, yeah. And it's actually going to depend on the speed of your flash drive, too. I had to buy a fast flash drive. Like, I researched which controller it uses or whatever. But uh, that's, just, that's more advanced stuff. But you typically, typically us, users might not need it. But if you want to make like cool stuff in like Excel and do things with the data, this is, that's the way to do it. Okay. So like one important thing you can see on a scope, which is very important I think with these video signals, especially the RGB and component stuff and in general is that uh, video signals uh, when they're AC coupled they lose all their DC content but a lot of people confuse DC uh, the DC level with black level mm -hmm. so or the ground reference with black level so right now if you look at these signals that the arrows are pointing at a level that's above where black is so black is where these you have these just solid lines that are just hanging down there, no, no video content. So like here, everything's black. But zero volts is above that. Okay. Um, and so the other thing is I'm gonna cycle through these patterns, and the difference where where black level is moves up and down. Oh wow. And it's only at zero when you have no signal. So that's a very important concept that's, it is kind of tricky to understand, but you need to know. So is it, it really oversimplifying if I say the only time you get no, um, no volt or no voltage is with no signal? Even on all black, you still get a negative voltage showing on screen? Uh, no, on black it was zero. Okay. It's just, I guess the, if you boil it down, it's your signal content determines where your black level is. And there's that's why there's these circuits that do clamping and DC restoration is because of this effect. Oh, okay. So there's, there's people who design circuits and they, they, they treat it like audio, where audio, no signal is the same as so you AC couple audio all the time and because you don't care about the DC. What I'm trying to show here is that the DC component is constantly changing with valid video data. It's hard, it's a, it's a weird concept to explain. I just kind of wanted to just show that this, basically this black level is just shifting up and down as I'm changing the signal. So I'll admit that I still don't 100% grasp what it is yes. that you're showing, but this does seem to me that a good demonstration of um, hobbyists who build circuits who don't grasp that. Um, you might end up doing things like building the output wrong or, or not understanding what kind of cable you might need based on the fact that um, the, the way this is designed. Uh, yeah, like if you're going to design like some circuit that takes this signal as an input and you're assuming that the black is zero volts, and you don't realize you have stuff like below zero, well, that's a big problem. I think you just said it perfectly. Yeah. Okay, now, now I understand a lot more, so. Yeah, I mean, that's just one specific 
symptom of that can go wrong, but there's others. It's just just more proof that uh, yeah. analog video signals are way more complicated than uh, than people people seem to understand. Yeah. All right. So when you were scrolling through um, the different things before, yeah. I saw this weird screen. Let me just try to get a focus on it real quick. So uh, what is this? So I I call this the bandwidth test, uh, and there's actually two of them here. Uh, this one is. Uh, two pixels of white followed by two pixels of black, two white, two black, and it alternates. And then there's this one, which is finer, which is one pixel of white, one pixel of black. And this is useful for showing on the scope how fast the video signal can change from its, um, I guess, its maximum and minimum positions. So, amplitude. could you zoom in on this? Yeah, yeah. So, like, the whole point, like, why this exists is I like to see how the signal behaves. But for something like this, this is where I would turn the bandwidth off. Okay. Uh, because I wanna see the full bandwidth. So I'm just gonna do probably channel two here. So I'm just gonna turn that off. So I would zoom in, actually let's, let's make this clear by just turning everything else off. So this is the signal going from black to white to black to white. And, and it looks very even here. This, yes. Okay. Um, and if you, if you put this specific pattern, like we have a Super Nintendo version of, of this, if you put it on the Super Nintendo and you're using the, the, something that's not a one chip, um, you'll see that it's, when it's going from black to white that it's struggling. And it's going really slow and doesn't even get to white before black comes and it goes back down to black pretty fast. And that's how you're actually able to show on a scope it's, that it doesn't reach the proper values and why it truly is a lesser quality signal. Yeah, that, that explains, that directly shows why it's blurry is because it can't change its signal fast enough. So last week, I lifted the subcarrier signal off of this Genesis 3 that we're using to disable composite video to remove the last little bit of jail bars that I had. If I had done a scope capture before and after, is that something that I might have seen, or is that just a completely different thing? No, you probably would have seen that on... Um Let's see, like on a, on a pattern that has a lot of color. Um, probably this one you would see, and you had your RGB hooked up. So let me just turn uh, everything back on here. Okay, um, yeah, I would probably, if you had your, like, subcarrier noise, probably if you're, let's say your green is high, like if you zoomed in a lot on the green, signal um you probably you might see, see like a little more of a fluctuation noise. than yeah. that yeah because huh. it's not going to be static it's going to be the noise is moving around it yeah well now i'm going to know what to do before i do any of these mods just so i could post scope plots as well as before yeah. and after screen captures just to demonstrate both the literal interpretation and the electrical interpretation yeah. of what's happening i mean there's there's other things you can do like you can take the fft and you could plot the spectrum because a subcarrier noise is going to have a peak at like that 3.579545 frequency and uh you can do that too but that's a little more complicated and it's slower because the thing is calculate all this stuff but well i think we went a little bit beyond beginner but this yeah. is awesome all right, so now I just want to show the basic how to use the scope with just one probe so you don't really get into any of the craziness we just did. But you have to calibrate the probe before actually using it the first time, correct? Uh, yeah, it's good to, to tweet. There's a, like a little frequency response potentiometer. or well, It's like a variable cap, basically, and it makes it so your signal, you can make your signal even on both edges uh, so okay. but first first though you got to go to your channel one and now we're going to use the 10x probe let's put it back to 10x um, so we're going to set that up first okay and so like there's a test like two test clips on uh the side of the scope here the bottom one is the ground there's like a little chassis symbol here okay so get ground up here and then we'll use the spring-loaded clip to uh 
good to go. And then, you know, we can set our trigger level. So we're trigger triggering. And uh, I guess we want to get it nice and big so we could see the most. Let's get rid of these cursors. Okay, so now we can uh, go to the little pot thing. They give you this little screwdriver thing to adjust. So I'm twisting it in both directions now. You see how the leading edge there kind of goes a little wonky? Right. So I'm just gonna try to make it as even as possible. Okay. And that's it. Okay. So we're just gonna do that again, cause I'm not really sure I had the full grasp of that. So I'm taking mm -hmm. a different one. I put a, a little blue ring around it just so I could understand that it's the different probe. Plugging it into channel one. So we're set to channel one. Yeah. Uh, I had to make sure that the probe is set to 10X because this is the 10X probe. Um, is there a switch on here? Yep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the can't really see it even if I zoomed in, but I'm gonna set it to 10x. Yeah. Um, then I set the little clip to the bottom. Yep. And set this to the top. Um, and what's uh, and that's really it, right? We didn't actually change anything here. We're just in the same basic read mode that we were for everything else, right? Well, I mean, if you didn't have the trigger level set up, it would have been like that. So you have to, okay. you have to so trigger. Okay, so it's the same as when you're going in for a, yeah. an analog signal, get the trigger yeah. in the middle. Yep. Yeah. And I'm just gonna use this thing. What do you think, that's about right? Uh, there we go, I think that's good, yep. Yeah. Okay. This probe is calibrated. Now let's check uh, the RGB signals coming in. So, so we need, uh, because I want to check all of the different um, points, I'm going to set this to a pure white screen. There we go. Uh, and we're going to be actually probing directly onto the SCART connector itself. So what we have here is we took the bottom clip onto ground. So you always have to make sure this bottom piece is grounded when you're taking these measurements. Um, and now we're gonna have the top connected to C-Sync. Um, and you have to keep it at the last uh, place before it goes into the monitor. Um, and it needs to be a live signal, so you can't just unplug this. It actually has to be plugged into the monitor with a load on it. I think this is a good place to stop the video because at this point all I would do is just show that same clip from the beginning where I touch a probe to the sync line of the SCART cable under load. But overall I think Steve did a really great job explaining what we need to know to understand how to test voltages of retro gaming setups on an oscilloscope. I think this is going to be a huge help for people to test their own cables, want to test their super guns, or really want to get into any of the arcade stuff as well. And I will be doing some follow-up videos about using a scope, but I'm going to try to really step by step into the next skill level because oscilloscopes themselves are very complicated. And then once you get the things past voltages, you're really talking about electrical engineering, circuit design, and in-depth knowledge of video signals. But I think maybe the next video I'd like to show is what component video looks like on a scope versus RGB. So people have a visual understanding of the differences and therefore the lack of differences. And then I'd like to do something that's a little more advanced, like how to take some RF only consoles and build your own composite video signal out of it, which in the confines of the video signal world is pretty easy, although hard if you've never done anything like that before. So overall, I think it, uh, we're making the right steps forward. Huge thanks to Steve once again for taking all the time to do that, and I really think this is going to be a big help to everybody. Well, that's it for now. If you liked this video, please consider subscribing to my Patreon, because without my amazing Patreon supporters, videos like this wouldn't be able to happen. Also, consider subscribing to my channel, and even check out the weekly podcast I do about everything that's going on in the retro gaming world. So I hope to see you guys next time, and thanks again for everybody's support.